You're listening to a podcast from the University of Manchester. Today in the studio at the University of Manchester, I'm talking to Dr Sharon McDonnell. Sharon has specialised in suicide bereavement for 16 years and is considered to be one of the leading specialists in this field. Every year she hosts a conference in Manchester on suicide bereavement, which welcomes professionals from around the world. In 2018, Sharon led an online survey for those impacted by suicide and with the help of social media, more than 7,000 people completed the survey. An advocate of the power of social media, Sharon has also collaborated with former professional footballer Neville Southall to raise awareness of mental health issues. And by sharing her own experience of losing a loved one to suicide, Sharon is a powerful voice for those that are left behind. So we're talking to Sharon today as part of our series of podcasts to mark World Mental Health Day. In relation to the survey that we're conducting, it's the first of its kind internationally. Sharon, thank you for agreeing to talk to us about a subject that lots of people still find hard to discuss. So the results of your survey are going to be published later this year. How important do you think your survey will be in giving people impacted by suicide a voice? Thank you for inviting me. So in relation to this survey, we're already receiving national and international interest for many reasons. One, because it's being led by people bereaved by suicide. Two, we're looking at those bereaved by suicide and those that are impacted. Ultimately, when there's a suicide, there's two sides to a coin. You've got the bereaved and those that look after us. And three, the way we've engaged with the general public is second to none. Some of it's happened by accident, but researchers internationally are looking because we actually recruited 7,000 people. Ultimately, this survey is, how can I put it, people have not had a voice, but because this survey is anonymous, because myself and my team are bereaved by suicide, what I've learned is goodwill and kindness generates more. So we've engaged with these people on Twitter and they've ultimately, what's quite interesting, for 12 months we were recruiting and every single day I would report back to these people and I would say, thank you for taking part uh, in the study. Ten of taking part, this means, and I would each day the number was going up. This happened by accident. And then after a few months, people, if I didn't do it, they'd go, what's the update? And I'm thinking, oh, God. <laughs> you know, <laughs> so what? So it might sound funny, but what I realised, this mattered to these people. Yeah. And then people will fill the survey in. Now, this is clinicians. This would be whoever. And, the, and then they'd say things like, I filled it in, kiss. And this would be men and women. And I'm thinking, what's happening here? This is something special. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what I've realised was, gosh, just saying, I filled it in, kiss or I've just done it, is probably the first time some of these people have publicly written yeah. out there. So what we've learned is these people are a stigmatised, vulnerable group, hard to engage, but the reality is if we have the right systems or vehicles in place, these people want to engage yeah. and they want a voice. And the fact that 7,000 people have filled this in is a testimony to that fact. So was that purely through Twitter? Oh, I mean, uh, was it word of mouth then? D- did it just grow and grow uh, that from I'd that? say it's like a snowball. Yeah. And uh, I loved it. And I can't claim that I've planned all this, but sometimes the best work is when it when you wing it or you sort of... And this is kind of what happened. We started off, we did different things, unlike, say, the BBC or the news or reporters. They tend to want all gory details or things like this, but this was different. Because everybody, so let's put it in perspective, there's 6,000 suicides every year. And for every suicide, this is science now, they say on average 135 people are affected and at risk of really? dying by suicide. So in the UK, if you have 6,000 suicides, 135 people affected, you can do the maths, it's about 810,000 people yeah. that are potentially at risk. So everybody... Like us in this room now, I could ask you and I would be confident at least one of you, everybody knows somebody. And because this is coming from the right place, well, honestly, the press were amazing. BBC Breakfast invited me on and we had no results. That was just to recruit. So I got 90 people filling it in after that. But the funniest and the best, I think, is Neville Southall. Yeah. (laughs) So what actually happened, so we was going on every day and then... Just women were filling it in. I'm thinking, oh, this is so big. Potentially, the government aware of this, other governments in other countries. So these findings, I knew we was going to get, we was hoping to get 5,000, but we got seven. They were nearly all women. 
Yeah. So anyway, this particular yeah. day, because it was like, it was like these people, I feel I know them and they feel like they know me. And this is what has been magical, really. Come on, you men, this is rubbish. <laughs> if you're not careful, you're going to end up, people are going to analyse this stuff, we'll develop this service for people bereaved by suicide and it won't be fit for you men, but you're not taking part. We need your help. You're going to have to get... So anyway, I didn't even know him. Neville Southall said, uh, Sharon, take over my account. That will get you some men. And I thought, oh, my God, I don't, what am I going to do with this? <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. I know nothing about football. <laughs> they say men don't talk. And then I'm going to be chatting on about suicide, a taboo topic. Anyway, yeah. um, we, it, it, he announced it on thing and I was on a few days later, two hours. Unbelievable. Unbelievable, yeah. the response. Some, I think, these people, I'd, men and high-risk group men, I would say, because I don't know how old Neville is in his 50s, so the high risk group. So these that idolise him yeah, are a high risk yeah. group, and because he was engaging in it, they engaged. And what's so interesting is they say men can't talk. Well, let me tell you, they can <laughs> write. If they think it's anonymous, and yeah. they're thinking they're helping others, unbelievable what they're writing. And I think what I've learnt from this is, you know, all oh, they'll say, oh, men can't talk, men can. We need to change that narrative. You know, we are failing men. Not yeah. that they're failing themselves. And I think, you know, and I've been reflecting on this quite a lot. What on earth are we doing with our young boys? You yeah. know, they listen. Oh, men can't talk. Men can't talk. Men don't engage. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. I don't know whether you've ever thought of it like that. They're coming up. And if you want to be a man, well, then you don't talk and yeah. you don't engage. Well, That's and I think for men especially as well, I mean, it's kind of getting that conversation started, isn't it? I think, well, like you say, once you get them to start talking, you know, that's when the floodgates open. But I think it's, it's getting that conversation started that's key, yeah. isn't it? Well, I'm going to share you stuff because like men, you know, we're like, we know we don't know much about them about this. So I'm going to share some couple of bits because they're funny. So if you're <laughs> reading 7,000 surveys, you know, difficult stuff. Yeah, but yeah. people's personalities come out, you know, yeah. and then like we would ask things about sexuality because we're looking at the LGBT community. There's all subgroups within this. Yeah. It's so complex. Yeah. But uh, like men and what, what happened with some of them, I think this is what's happening. They're a bit nervous about doing it. So they're going, you know, because this is massive. It's yeah. 72 questions. It's like an Argos catalogue of <laughs> questions. It's not a one yeah. pager. So then they would go, you know, like, uh, and they would make me laugh. And I was glad for the light relief, if you can imagine how difficult this was. Yeah. And then uh, they'd go like, oh, occupation. And then it'd be mechanic, this, oh, and also good kisser. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's funny. But I think what was actually yeah. happening for some of these men, they've got to... They're nervous about doing it and they'll use humour and things. And right. then when it comes to the difficult stuff, well, yeah. let me tell you, they answered it and they did an amazing job. So if it takes listening to being a good kisser, we'll go with it because yeah. what we've actually done, we've got over to. Uh, over 2,000 men filling in 72 questions, lots of free text. So there's statistics, but it's the free text. And I can confidently say if we get funding from government to analyse this, we could get an insight on what men want. And rather than saying, oh, they don't talk or, oh, they don't do this, they're telling us what they want. And the key is we have to listen and government have to act yeah, and provide funding so that we can give them what they need because this has demonstrated these people can, these men can engage in this yeah. sensitive stuff. Is that kind of the positive action you are hoping is going to to happen from this? That there will be more funding available. I mean, what what do you see happening after after the results are published? So I've said to you before, suicide is complex. Within you know you've got vulnerable groups, so men are recognised as a high risk group. Mothers. Then you've got LGBT community. We're learning about friends. So there's subgroups within subgroups. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So we yeah. have this unique, priceless data set. We've demonstrated against all odds with no funding. We've done this study. Health professionals, for example, have, have had to take part in a study led by someone bereaved yeah. to get a voice. So we've done that. The hard to engage, well, 7,000 people We've demonstrated we can engage with these people. We have got findings. We will come with recommendations. We can't do any more than that. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of... But I do believe the government are engaging in this 
And when they realise the value of what we've got, I'm really hoping and I really think they will provide funding because ultimately it will help to save lives. You yeah. Know? Well, I think like you say as well, it, it's different groups as well that yeah. maybe haven't had that attention in the past. Do you see that as maybe being part of it as well? Maybe channeling funding to, to sort of more specific groups? Absolutely. Because they have maybe different needs and Absolutely. different ways of expressing it. And one particular, well, there's loads. It's unbelievable. And I can't share too much because we've not published. But we've, uh, we're ethnic minority groups. So we know nothing. And uh, we, But all, what we do definitely know is they're all at risk of dying by suicide, potentially. I don't mean all of them, but it's they're all yeah, risk, effective. high risk factor, yeah. And they've engaged in it. Yeah. And this, it's only 3%, and you think, oh. But 3% of 7,000 people is quite a lot, and it's a start. So we're getting insights into the LGBT community, students. So I'm thinking or hoping, I'm total optimist here, <laughs> despite not having fun at the beginning, that you know pe- we can tell them what samples we've got or data sets on subgroups and then I think government departments, say for example students, you know people might be interested in that. We can, we can break it down in countries, counties, occupation. So yeah, I'm pretty chuffed with it to be honest. Well, I think you should be because I think it's a oh, it's it's a fantastic achievement, really. But you I've got to say, I'm leading it, but uh, so we haven't got money, and and my team are all doing it for nothing in our spare time. Now that's a bit of a joke because you can ask anyone who has spare time in the, when they're working. We do the reality is we're doing it evenings, weekends, annual leave. Credit to them all, and just because we're not pay- we we're not a bargain basement team, we're the best. Yeah, we have, yeah. Uh, you know, we have a clinician. We've got myself. We've got a mum bereaved by suicide, and two other researchers. Can I name them? Because they work at the university. Yeah, yeah. sure. Yeah, I yeah. Can I name them all? Go on then. <laughs> so you've got Dr. <laughs> Isabel Hunt, Dr. Sandra Flynn, Shirley Smith from If You Care Share, and Barry McGale from Suicide Bereavement UK, and myself. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think actions speak louder than words. How many people would do something for nothing for? four years yeah that's of international importance it's a great achievement i think you know there's seven thousand people you know Mm. with no funding and just kind of like harnessing the power of social media really but i think this is like a really good example of how social media can be positive really yeah you know getting the word out I think you're right, and it's like Neville self. So when he found out about this, and he, he, he let me have his... I mean, can you imagine that? Being given his password and going on. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this because it's quite funny. So um, so I thought, oh, God, I'm going on this. No one's going to talk to me. I'm just going to be silent, talking to myself on Twitter. <laughs> and uh, so I thought, oh, what am I going to talk about? What am I going to talk about? So I thought, right, I'll I'll tell them about my work. Yeah. So I said, oh, my... Uh, oh, my name is Sharon. Uh, Neville's invited me to go on Twitter. You, you go on Twitter, so you'll know what it's like. But actually, people don't read them in, in order. Yeah. But the next yeah. one, I thought, right, I'll tell them that I've been bereaved by suicide. That Some men might engage in it then. So yeah. I put, I lost my brother, age 29, and I went on. But because they hadn't read them in order, they thought Neville was disclosing he'd lost his brother oh, on no. Twitter. <laughs> and then they're all going, oh, sorry about that, big Nev, rest in peace. And I'm thinking, oh, my, I've only been on it two seconds. <laughs> and uh, what actually happened, and then I, I went to Neville and said, oh, n- private message him, oh, I'm sorry, Neville. I'd only been on, I couldn't have been a minute, <laughs> two a second. And he went, Sharon, if you can handle it, I can. So he come on and says, it's not me, it's Sharon. I thought, God, by, uh, by the time I come off, it's going to be on News at 10 that he discloses <laughs> on Twitter he's lost his brother. And that is why we got 400 men, because they just, once they let rip and started talking, and then it, it was irrelevant who'd lost who, they, yeah. they'd started disclosing stuff, and they just, and then they were chatting to me. So that mistake I made yeah. Was, yeah. It was a positive thing. And so I call Neville Southall Robin Hood. And yeah. the reason I call him Robin Hood is because, you know, you get a lot of celebrities and they're not role models, really, you know, and they're driven by money and different things. But what he does, he uses his fame, he uses, I think he's got 153,000 followers, he uses his fame, his connections, his Twitter account, and he gives people a voice that haven't got one. And I think, 
how nice is that? Yeah. You know? Yeah. So you're absolutely right. Social media, there's lots of stuff I don't like on social media. This is wonderful. And these people, I call them Team UK. And it might sound corny. It's really not. So the conference, they go out. This is all This is all evolved from his Twitter. The the uh, They're going to have a sticker on the badge. And they're going to be called Team UK in brackets Twitter. So they can all find each other. And you'll think, how magical is that? Yeah. It's special, I think. So Neville, he allowed you to take over his Twitter account. What else has he been involved with that's helped with the survey and the conference? Well, he's been amazing. On Twitter, every day from them virtually, he, he would, you know, and then there'd be odd time to say, I'm going on my holiday, Sharon, so I won't be on. You know, so he really committed to it. But I hadn't clicked at the time. It, uh, he'd lost a friend. Yeah. Paul, yeah. Gary Speed, you'll be familiar with. Yeah, 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 we do. So, uh, um... So he's, you know, unbelievable. Some of the people he contacted, famous people on Twitter, and some engaged, some didn't. But he's done lots of other things as well. He was interviewed by The Guardian, and I was invited, you know, to, to say how I'd Im- engaged with Neville. And uh, so what what he actually did, which was amazing, you know, we all know in academia and research, it's all perceived as a bit stuffy and a bit brainy and loads of boffins. But he actually, uh, he got this study in the Guardian and the sports page who gets research on sports pages so he was taking it out there you know uh, and then I didn't know but he didn't even tell me this is what's so lovely about him you know he speaks it which I love he speaks his mind men love him and uh, (laughs) but he doesn't show off neither so I found out by accident someone telling me he referred to the study in his uh, book there's a book by uh, about Gary Speed yeah and uh it's a, each chapter is about Gary's friends and Neville was one of his friends. Right. And the quote, I found out by accident, there's a quote at the beginning of the chapter and he says, oh, I work with Sharon MacDonald on the suicide bereavement study and that's how it started in the book. So it did lots of things and, you know, we, we acknowledged him in the report because of his contribution because we wouldn't have got as many men as we've got and we're very grateful for for that. So of course he came to the conference as well in in Manchester that was at the end of September so such was his uh, promotion of your survey. Absolutely and he's my hero now I don't like football I'm I'm not so keen on it I don't understand the offside rule but I you and me both (laughs) but I understand and respect someone that cares about others that you know, they're, that other people judge or can't have a voice, you know. And I think, oh, wow. So he's my hero, not because of football, <laughs> because he's a decent, nice man. Well, it's good to see that someone has been so influential, really, in getting, you know, this survey to yeah. to quite a hard-to-reach group, I think. Yeah. The conference in Manchester, who is that aimed at in, in particular? Is Is it just the health profession or is it just a wide variety right so it's it's factual so if someone was recently bereaved it's not suitable but it's originally it was designed for professionals that come into contact with the bereaved but some bereaved come charities come police come teachers priests you name it each year if they come once they come again so each year it gets bigger this year over 400 people from 10 countries came But I I want to share this little bit with you because it sounds small, but it's massive. They all have badges on and uh, there's so much shame and stigma associated with suicide. Just little things can be big things to these people. So we asked them, we have this poster and you have to put a dot on. On the top of this poster, it was breaking stigma, one person, one step at a time. And they would choose who they lost and they put the badge, the dot on the badge. So they're strutting about with these dots on the badges. And for some, that was a big deal. Some would leave it a couple of hours before they put the dot on. And so if you can imagine it, you've got people bereaved who they've lost. Some had more than one dot, sadly. Then you would have clinicians who's lost a patient in the same no, room mm. as the other bereaved. But what I would say that's massive on this, it's like no other conference, is respect yeah, they, yeah. So walking around with a badge with a dot is a bit like on Twitter. I filled it in kiss. It's a yeah. big deal. So much so they robbed me badges when they were going. <laughs> they didn't hand them in because it wasn't. And I get it. It wasn't just a dot on a badge. It was 
walking around for six hours with that on for everyone to see. But what actually happens is each peop people look for someone they can... Uh, if you've got the same colour dot, yeah. you've got some... Yeah. So people have natural conversations. So ultimately, it's for anybody that cares about this issue and mm. it's worked so far. Well, I, I think you make a very valid point there about for some people it is hard because I've lost a family member to suicide and I know I find it hard to tell people, not so much from myself, but because I know they're going to not know how to react. And how do we sort of get over that, do you think? Right, as... Well, I'm sorry for your loss, you know, it's... And it's true, actually. We have to manage everybody else's emotions when it should I be think, the other way yeah. around. <laughs> so I remember when I was a little girl, it's not about suicide now, all the neighbours would shut the curtains. You would never overtake a hearse. We had all these little simple rules. There was no words, yeah. but out you could show your respect. Well, we've got rid of all those, but we've not replaced them with anything. Yeah. And so yeah. Uh, we, we don't know what to say a lot of the time, so we blurt stuff out. So I think society needs some guidance. We're not bad people. We just don't know, so we either say nothing yeah. or inappropriate. Yeah. But if anything from listening to this podcast, I would ask people, please don't say commit. Yeah. It's not been a crime since 1961. These people... If you say died by suicide, that's like well, not commits. That is very distressing for a lot of people. I don't know yeah. whether you've experienced well, that. Yeah, I do. And I think that's the thing I find hard sometimes. I think, how do I say this? How do I broach this without... I, I, I do find the language surrounding it very hard sometimes. And I think that's the thing. It's like, do I just say nothing? Which sometimes is the easiest yeah. way, really, possibly. Not you know probably the best always but sometimes it just feels the easiest and I think because there is this language surrounding it that that is so difficult and there's not really many alternatives it, it does yeah. make a conversation about it very very hard yeah and it's kind of I, I would like to recommend as well there's there's something that people can download and it's called finding the words and it's guidance on what words to use so if people are listening to this podcast and thinking oh god yeah I've I've got people on it, you know, I don't know what to say or, you know, just download that, read it and it will guide you. And then because what actually happens and this is the reality and this is coming out in the survey. I mean, I'm, I'm exaggerating here, people diving in privets, but you'll have experienced it in the supermarket. People avoid you and different things yeah, like that. Yeah. And friendships, lifelong friendships can be lost because we all know when we have friends or family, this is unwritten code that you're always there for each other and you always know they will be. But the reality is when this happens, there's always someone that isn't that should be and it's because they haven't got the words, they don't know what to say and time passes. And that that's sad really because they yeah. can never be healed, those things. But equally, and I'm sure it's the same for you, there'll have been someone stepped up and been kind to you who you might not have even consider to be a friend, but you never, ever forget that kindness, I don't think. Yeah, mm. and sometimes it just can be in a totally unexpected way as well, I yeah. think. That's probably the, the main thing as well, isn't it? Yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't have to, it doesn't even have to be verbal sometimes, you know. It is very difficult, and I suppose that is part of some of the problem as well, that maybe people do feel a bit marginalised when you know, they've been affected by suicide. Can I just mention now, so actually, because it's relevant, but I, I, I developed evidence-based suicide bereavement training to teach health professionals or professionals, any pro anyone that comes into contact with those bereaved by suicide, to teach them how to respond to those bereaved by suicide. That was funded by the National Institute for Health and Research. All oh, right. So that's the first of its kind internationally. And uh, I know the university are, are very proud of it because ultimately, I think as researchers, we do research, we have findings, and then we publish. But I think we can go that extra mile. And I think that's what I did, to be fair. I did research, we identified findings and translated those into evidence-based training. Pretty exciting, really. I've done the training, I've got the conference, and we've got the survey. I think... It, if I'm honest, I think I'm creating a kind of a social movement here, a positive one, yeah. and we're getting a voice, and our voice is based on science, and as it comes out, we will, you know, but when we launch this report, we will ask people to disseminate it. 
And that's when Team UK on Twitter, yeah. they're better than anyone. They're on it. They'll find yeah. me reporters. They will disseminate it. And, and ultimately, all positives, I think. There's more stuff that needs to be done. It's it it's actually breaks down into subgroups that need to be analysed more. Right. There's lots of stuff in there. It's coming out of our ears, to be quite honest, the stuff, but it's amazing. So this report, this is how I perceive it, the report will be the foundations of stats, but based from that foundation of that report, lots of publications will come that will build like building blocks on top of that. You've taken a very unique career path. How did you come to specialise in suicide bereavement research? Right, so I, I lost my brother and he was uh, 29. Ironically, you make your own uh, anniversaries up. This year, he's been dead as long as he's been alive. Oh, goodness. But um, I what very common grief response when people die by suicide, the families go searching. I'm no doubt you, it's the same for you. Yeah. Why, what if, if only... Well, and you go reading, searching, and it's like you've got to let people do this. It's really, really important. And out of everything bad in life, no matter what it is, I do believe there's something positive. And I don't mean I'm glad my brother died. I don't mean that. What I'm trying to say is the positives for me, my searching, my pain, resulted in educating myself. I left school with no qualifications at all, and and I just kept reading and searching. So I, I did a degree. I've got a PhD now. And uh, so ultimately, I wear two hats. I'm bereaved and I'm recognised internationally as an expert in this field. And it's kind of my work is personal and professional and you can't separate. And I don't even want to. So, yeah, I, I and I know I'm not a typical academic as well. But that's all right as well. You know, yeah. I think I'm a bit of a late developer in everything, <laughs> to be honest. No bad thing, I suppose. No, not at all. <laughs> So we, uh, we talk about the consequences of suicide and how it affects those left behind. What positives can we draw from how we deal with it or how we support each other? So I would say for those bereaved by suicide, quite a few people say this, we're in a club that no one wants to be in, you know. And out of us all, or the majority of us, you know, it's kind of, Flows you absolutely flows you, but then there's a few of us, and there's not many, but there's a few of us that will dust ourselves down, and then we try to be a voice for all the others. And I think a classic example is the survey. You know, so it's a bit ridiculous that we've done this for nothing, but you know, we do it in memory of we've loved and lost. But equally, we dared, dared to ask these questions that a lot of clinicians wouldn't dare to ask these people. And all I can say to you is. These people believe they're getting a voice and they dared answer. They dug deep because we knew how hard it would be for them, but they did it. And I think this is a, a classic example how we're vulnerable, but equally you put us all together, we're a force to be reckoned with. So 7,000 people filling this in, these people don't want to be in the dark or the shadows anymore. They want a voice. And I think when we present this report, I think people will have to listen, but more than listen, I think government will have to act based on, on what we will report. So, yeah, I, I think the survey is a good example, really. Well, it's been absolutely fascinating talking to you today, Sharon. I think it's testament to your determination that, you know, the survey has been such a success. We look forward to seeing the results when they're published. And there's no doubt you've given people that have impacted by suicide a voice and you'll continue to do so. So thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. If you have been affected by any of the issues raised in this podcast, you can call the Samaritans 24 hours a day, seven days a week on 116 123. You can also find details of local support groups by searching online for survivors of bereavement by suicide.